It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Reaction being the yo 245. Day in the neighborhood. My brothers and sisters. As always, man, hope y'all doing excellent day out there today, tonight, or whenever you watch this damn video, man. Appreciate y'all. I love y'all and I thank y'all as always for coming on back to the channel once again and fucking with the bean. Now, we finna go back to our homeboy channel and it's crazy to say this, but I think it has been at least a month, maybe three weeks, you know what I'm saying? But it's been a while, y'all. It's been a while since we last watched the uh, video from this man. And it's the dude that I got like third pr third place as far as, you know what I'm saying, these true crime content creators that I love to watch over here. We got Mr. Ballin, then we got Mike from that chapter, and then we got this man right here. Adrian from Coffee House Crime. Go on back to Adrian, y'all. Title of the video. The teen boy who murdered his family over a video game. Daniel Patrick. Now, just from reading the title, I'm thinking it's gonna be some shit like he got mad because his mama or his daddy, like his parents, told him you can't play this video game no more until you start doing better in school. Until you do your homework, start doing your homework, or you gotta do these chores before you go start playing this damn game all damn night. You know what I'm saying? Like they were trying to put some responsibility in his life and he got mad about it and ended up killing him. I mean, that's just what it sounds like, but you know it's going to be a little deeper than that. But at the end of the day, it's petty as fuck. It's crazy as fuck that he would do this, regardless of whatever, the, how the situation worked out. I don't know, man. That's just my, you know, first guesses before we get into this thing. But before we get into this thing, man, for real, y'all know what y'all got to do. Get whatever you might need. Get what you need. We back to Adrian. We back to the coffee, man. Y'all got what y'all need. Y'all ready to go? Then let's fucking go. We all have disagreements within our family, be it over trivial things like what to watch on TV or more serious issues like finances and partners. But when stubborn child Daniel Petrick clashed with his parents over a copy of Halo 3, their battle would end in the most unthinkable of ways, leaving one dead and another fighting for their life. Daniel's story would not stop there either. Outrage aside, it was the next case to spark nationwide debate over the video game industry, and further question the notion of violence for entertainment. But who was Daniel Petrick? What actions did he take against his parents? And what was the aftermath? Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the case of Daniel Petrick. You know, I used to play a lot of video games while growing up. Things like Call of Duty, World of Warcraft, Battlefield, back when the series was good, and even GTA. To say that gaming was a large part of my life while growing up is quite an understatement. I made many friends, who I still know today, learned a fair few things, and had a lot of fun. However, there is a very fine balance when it comes to video games, and that's a balance that parents have to decide for their own children. True. But who knew that it could end in murder? Before we begin, and just to let you know, that I post true crime and strange cases here weekly. So if that does sound like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to the channel, it really does help me out. And now, with that said, please, grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Daniel Petrick. Get whatever you may need. And did y'all hear that shit, y'all? Five... No, he said leaving one dead and five fighting for their life. So there's six people that his family damn members, his sisters and his mama and daddy, like, dude, over fucking Halo. Let's see how this shit go.
Well, well, Wellington, isn't it good to see you? Touch down in the city of Cleveland and head 30 miles southwest, and you'll find yourself traveling through the small town of Wellington, Ohio. With a meager population of 5,000 residents, Wellington is best described as a quiet town with plenty of charm. As you can likely imagine, not that much goes on here. Most of what Wellington has to offer includes the great outdoors. The town has a library, a middle school, a town hall, and this weird train thing, whatever it is. Not a lot for a young kid to do, as you can likely guess. And this is perhaps something to keep in mind while going through our case today. Anyway, it's here in the leafy neighborhoods of Wellington that we find the Petrick family. Susan Petrick, aged 43, and her husband Mark were the proud parents of their two daughters Heidi and Holly, and of course, their son, Daniel. The Petricks were a typical suburban family. Susan and Mark had been married for around 23 years. Focusing on Susan, she was born and raised in Chevalier, Maryland. And it was after attending Valley Forge Christian College in Pennsylvania that she met and fell in love with Mark. At the time that this story takes place, Susan was happily working in Weber's Healthcare, a nursing home found within Wellington. Whereas, for Mark, he was a Pentecostal minister at the New Life Assembly of God. As a result, all three children were raised in a Christian household. They were all described as having a good relationship with their parents, and the family home was about as peaceful as a family of five could get. Focusing on our main character of the story today, Daniel Petrick was a 16-year-old kid who fit the American standard. Born on August the 24th, 1991, he was 16 years old at the time this story took place. Growing up, his friends and family described him as a normal and happy teenager, fun to be around and friendly to talk to. To add to this, he also appeared to be very enthusiastic about the Bible in his younger teen years, and remained out of trouble while at school too. And although he may not have been the brightest crayon in the box, he certainly was not the most dull either, and was able to consistently achieve average to good school grades. Being a teenager growing up in a small American town, it is no surprise that Daniel found quite a large interest in video games and unfortunately, after a spinal injury, this interest would continue to grow. After contracting a spinal injury during a skiing holiday, Daniel was housebound for more than an entire year. As a result, the TV became his best friend, and eventually, the Xbox did too. But herein lies the problem, because although Mark didn't mind video games, he despised violent ones, and that's when Daniel started to take an interest. You see, at the time, in the year 2007, parents were not too sure what to think about violent video games. The realism was relatively new, and they didn't know how it would affect their children. Actually, even I faced this issue. I was 15 years old at the time, and my mum was not comfortable with the game GTA. In fact, it was banned in the family house, and so I snuck around a friend's house to play it instead. You know, at the time it really aggravated me, but I guess in hindsight I fully understand why she was uncomfortable. So, I guess mum, I'm sorry. Anyway, this was when Dan Hey, real quick, y'all. Coffee House ain't telling no lies, man. Now, I don't know about 2007 because I was old enough at that point to buy my own rated M for mature video games, or was I? Now, I was like 16, 17, but I was close enough where I could play them. But back in like the early 2000s, bro, I was first playing Grand Theft Auto when I was like 12 years old, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can remember my sister Kiki the one who had to buy me Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. And I remember when we went up into the EB Games. Yes, EB Games. We going back that far. I'm talking to the game of freaks out there. Because I used to be one too. I ain't going to lie. I used to be a game of freak back in them days. But I can remember going to EB Games. And the dude, it was me and my sister. And she had to actually, you know, show her ID and shit to actually pay for the game. And the, uh, the, the uh, worker at the store, he knew that he, she was buying it for me. And he was telling her, you know that this got cussing and it got violence and it got this and that but my sister the shame kill same thing with my mama she she knew them games was violent as fuck but it's just different stroke for different folk my mama knew that shit wasn't gonna make me grow up and be a crazy motherfucker but for some kids i will playing them video games spend it back in the day when that shit was fresh like that gta just was just mind blowing like oh my god this is just the most ridiculous this is not pac-man anymore we're not playing super mario and fucking tetris this is another level of some fucked up shit and all parents went cool with it my mom was cool with it but all parents went cool with it let's go daniel and his friends all found an interest in halo 3 and back in the patriarch household that's when tension began to grow 
For those of you who don't know, Halo is a first-person shooter that puts you in the shoes of Master Chief, an enhanced super soldier that must fight aliens and parasites. Halo was massively popular back in the day, and still has a very loyal fanbase. It was the best-selling game of 2007, and even still today, is considered to be one of the most influential FPS games of all time. So it's kind of obvious why a 16 year old would love to play this game, and especially if all of his friends were playing it too. But Daniel's gaming habits remained unchecked, and he would play more than 8 hours of video games every single day. Dang. And when his father banned Halo 3 from the household, he would simply go over to his friend's house instead. And as you can likely imagine, as the consequences against Daniel increased, so did his reaction against them. Tensions really began to build in October 2007, and it all started when Daniel asked his father if he could buy him a copy of Halo 3. The answer was of course no, which provoked a tantrum from the teenager. Mark remanded that his son was to stop playing all violent video games. The man was very closely aligned with his Christian beliefs, and thought that these games were bad for Daniel's mind. He therefore gave his son an ultimatum, stop playing Halo 3, or move out of the house. Damn. Daniel, being the short-sighted teenager, picked the latter, moving in with a friend for several days as they played games for up to 18 hours a day. However, when his friend's parents grew concerned, they requested that Daniel moved back home. Naturally, this did nothing to fix the tension between father and son. Mark's boundaries remained very clear, but Daniel was ready to test them. After sneaking out of his bedroom window, Daniel travelled to his local GameStop to buy himself a copy of Halo 3. However, after bringing it home and sneakily trying to play it, his father caught him in the act. And as expected, a huge argument broke out between him and his parents. Confiscating it off of him, Mark placed the game inside the family safe, storing it next to his Taurus PT-92 handgun. Both of these oh, things were shit. inaccessible without the safe's key, which Mark kept in his own secret location. And with both objects strictly out of access for the troubled teenager, Mark hoped that the issue would settle down in the coming days. But unfortunately for him, and even more unfortunately for his wife, these hopes would be dashed in the most horrific of ways. Now see, when I first started this video off, y'all, I was thinking, like I was saying, that they told him, you can't play no more until you actually, you know, do your chores around the house. Then you can play, uh, you know what I'm saying? You uh, do your homework, then you can play. No, nah, this family right here, this daddy was like, this shit ain't even coming in my house. And I knew a couple of, um, you know what I'm saying, people that I was growing up with, you know, students at the school, classmates who couldn't play Grand Theft Auto. They mama went having that shit. A couple of them, I knew a couple. One just flashed in my head, like right now, dude, we was like fucking 14, man. And his mom and daddy would not let him play none of these shooting video games, no none of that shit. So the shit real. But damn, just because they ain't let, I'm talking about my homeboy back then, just because they ain't let him play the game and make him want to kill him. This dude, he'll crazy. Let's go. October the 20th, 2007, started like any other weekend. It was a Saturday, and the Petrick family were enjoying their time off. Their older daughter, Heidi, was expected to come home later that evening, where they would all watch baseball together. As the evening approached, Daniel walked into the family living room to talk to his parents. And with a tone of excitement in his voice, he asked them to close their eyes. I have a surprise for you, he said. Mark and Susan were rather shocked by this. Daniel had spent the last few days in a very foul sulk. However, he now appeared to be positive and in an apparently giving mood. Curious to know what his surprise was, they both closed their eyes while remaining seated on the sofa. And with their eyes closed, Mark could hear Daniel walk behind him. With bated breath, he waited with anticipation as to what his son could be up to. But that was when he heard the all-too-familiar metallic click. In one of the most devious plots ever, Daniel had tricked his parents into lowering their guard. There was no surprise waiting for them. And now, with Mark's eyes closed, Daniel cocked the gun to the back of his head. In a feeble attempt to recover his game, Daniel had spent the last few days trying to find the key to the safe. And now that he'd opened it, he found the gun next to his copy of Halo 3. It was then, armed with his father's handgun, that Daniel stepped into the world of irreversible actions. He shot his father once in the head, before firing four rounds at his mother. The bullet to Mark's head had incredibly not killed him, but he was only a hair's breadth from death. As for his mother, 
she had unfortunately died, making Daniel a cold-blooded killer. It's just the way he did it. He ain't have to do, talking about close your eyes. and He ain't have to do it like that. He could have just easily walked in that room and just pow, 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 whatever, while they was on the sofa. The way he did that shit was so evil and fucked up. Now I'm getting mad at the Daniel ass. I almost call him the devil because that's some devilish ass shit he did. It was at that moment that, out of sheer coincidence, Daniel's sister had just returned home with her husband. And after knocking on the front door, Heidi was greeted by Daniel. But something immediately seemed off about this. After asking if she could enter, he replied with, You shouldn't come in. Mum and Dad had a big argument. Heidi could hear moaning in the background. It was her father trying to call out for help. That was when she pushed past Daniel, and while she realized the horror that had just unfolded, Daniel had rearmed himself with the handgun. Now, fortunately, his sister's husband thought very quickly and was able to pull the gun away from him. It was only now that, with the weapon wrenched out of his grasp, Daniel took the opportunity to flee. And of course, this was with his copy of Halo 3 in hand. What's going on? I don't know what happened. I just came over to my parents' house because we were going to watch the game, and... Um, my mom is shot, and my dad is shot, and my brother's here. <laughs> Does anybody know what happened? Did, did your brother shoot your parents? I don't know. I did know. <laughs> Whatever the plan was, Daniel would never get the chance to play Halo 3 again, because shortly after fleeing with the family van, several police officers were able to locate, apprehend, and arrest Daniel easily. Life as a free person would come to an end for Daniel just after 7pm, but before going down, the young boy made one last effort to feign his innocence, and disgustingly, that would be by blaming his own father. While Daniel began his battle with the law, Susan's body was recovered by forensics while Mark was busy fighting for his life. Susan had been shot three times by Daniel, once in the chest and then the right arm, with a third and final shot to the head. She died almost immediately. As for his father, Mark, he was rushed to the nearest hospital where doctors did their very best to save his life. After feeling his head turn numb through a shattered jaw, Mark fell unconscious and slipped into a coma. In the meanwhile, the interrogation room was not a friendly place for Daniel. Both he and his story were heavily scrutinized under a fine lens. And the harder that officers pushed him, the closer he came to cracking. Hours into the interview, he finally gave up his story and confessed to his evil actions. Although the clip is not publicly available without copyright infringement, Daniel said the following to investigators. I was sitting in my room, and then my dad was just yelling, just screaming at my mum. My dad walked into his bedroom and then walked back out. And then I heard a gunshot. I ran out there and my mum had been shot. He pointed the gun at me, and then he said he was sorry, and then he shot himself. Thankfully and miraculously, Mark would slowly recover from his critical injuries. However, this would only be after spending two weeks in a coma. However, doing so would come at the terrible cost of several realizations. Not only did he have to regain and relearn all of his bodily function, but he would also find out that his wife had been murdered. To add to this pain, Mark would never get full closure by attending his wife's funeral, which had been held during the two weeks that he was still in a coma. It was now, through his physical struggles, that an emotional struggle raged within. His very own son had shot him and killed his wife, and he'd have to work through these devastating feelings. Crazy.
As you can likely imagine, Mark received a lot of attention due to the unimaginably difficult predicament he found himself in. He even admitted that, after finding out what had happened, he initially hated his son. So much so, that he internally debated killing him at the first opportunity he had. However, being a pastor, he said he turned to God to help him forgive his son as he recovered from his own wounds. During this time, he often reflected on one specific quote from the Bible. Forgive them, Father, they know not what what they do. And slowly, over time, Mark eventually forgave his son. Both of his sisters would eventually too. But in the meantime, and before Daniel's trial would commence, Mark had to recover. It turns out that Daniel's shot towards the back of Mark's head had actually entered through his cheekbone and deflected downwards, shattering his jaw but leaving his brain entirely intact. The bullet wow. managed to avoid all contact with his brain and cervical spine, giving him a very strong chance at survival and recovery. However, this would not be without spending an entire month in hospital, and accounting for a total of five major surgeries. Mark required reconstruction to his eye socket, the roof of his mouth, and also his jaw. He was unable to speak for a very long while, would often shake, and was understandably left with a very strong case of post-traumatic stress disorder. However, slowly but surely, he regained his health and eventually his strength. Now, of course, there is a lot to talk about and how America as a nation responded to this case. Most of this centered around Halo 3 and Daniel's apparent thirst for violence. To be honest, it is very strange how the court responded to this case. We'll get to this debate in just a moment. Moving to the legal proceedings of this case, his trial was a surprisingly emotional one. Devoid of anger and blaming, Daniel seemed to show real accountability for his actions, while his family did their very best to show forgiveness. The prosecution disputed that Daniel did not show full remorse for his crimes, and therefore asked for the maximum sentence. However, Daniel's eyes were visibly red from crying throughout the entire trial especially during statements read to and from his family. Addressing his father, he said, Dad, I miss mum. I miss my mum. I don't understand why I did something so terrible. The defense also argued that, while he did take accountability, it was his parents that gave him the Xbox console, that he was at the mercy of Halo's violent influence, and that Daniel heavily and unnaturally relied on the console for entertainment due to his spinal injuries. It was also highlighted that he never showed any signs of aggression before the murders, and had even tried to reason with his parents by seeking guidance on Christian websites. However, the prosecution argued that this was a cold-blooded attempt to murder his parents, motivated by a deep anger after being banned from playing Halo 3. They further highlighted his malicious intent during the murders. Not only did he conduct them with trickery, but he tried to frame his dad too. It was revealed during the trial that, as he lay there dying, Daniel planted the gun into Mark's hand and said, Hold on to the gun, Dad. Hold on to it. It was wow. majorly accepted that Daniel had intended to kill his father, and that his life was unintentionally spared when his daughter arrived home early, therefore scuppering Daniel's plans. When it came to his father, Mark could have been the man to save or sink his son's life. As a man who loved his son, but also lost his wife, he faced the most difficult of decisions. He could either seek absolute justice for Susan, or salvage what he had left of his family. Mark responded in the most noble of ways. He would visit his son every week in the months leading up to his trial, listened to his thoughts and feelings, and then went with what he thought was true. Addressing the judge and the courtroom, Mark forgave his son with love and understanding. He said he believed that his son deserved a second and chance, only after allowing the pain that runs deep to better him inside. Andy has had to face and is now facing the very serious consequences of what he did on October 20th, 2007. I know, without any doubt, he has severe regret, remorse, and guilt for what he did to his mom and I that evening. I can't count the number of times he has told me that he is so sorry for what he did and he'll never be able to forgive himself. I can also count the number of times he has told me that he is so happy that I survived and is so glad to still be able to see me. He's told me that numerous times. I love you, Danny. I can't count the number of times that he said, Dad, I miss Mom. I miss mom. 
His pain runs very deep, and it should. I believe, I believe it should run deep. And if his, if his pain did not run deep, I guarantee you, I would not be standing here speaking on his behalf. I call him like I see him. And I would not stand here and talk on his behalf if his pain didn't run deep. I know it does. So I'm asking the court on Danny's behalf for a lenient sentence. I'm not saying he does have remorse and regret. And I believe God is a God of forgiveness and a God of second chances. When it came to a verdict, there the leaning at my motherfucking ass. I, hey, man. Hey, listen. First of all, y'all. Just first of all. I get it. I get it because he a parent. But I just need to. Maybe I just need to ask this question to y'all. How I looked at that whole shit. Okay. Follow me now. Okay. You a parent. You got your spouse. Your, and you have a child. Your spouse get murdered by your child. Are you going to be able to fucking want them to get a lenient sentence? Are you going to be able to forgive them? You should forgive them. I agree with that part. But the thing is, you can never forget. And not only did he murder your spouse, he actually tried to murder you too. He shot you and thought you was dead. And if uh, your other child didn't show up and stop you from uh, being dead, he would have killed your ass eventually too. I'm just saying, man, fuck that. At the end of the day, you do the crime, you got to do the time. I don't give a damn with my child or not. And I'm not a parent yet, so I can't speak from a parent's perspective, so to speak. But it, I just feel like if I had a child and he didn't got to be murdered my damn wife. You can murder somebody on the street, and if you was in the wrong, you in the wrong, bro. You got to go do your time, man. I, I, I'm not, I, I can't forget. I, I can forgive a murderer, but I still think a uh, punishment, even though you forgive somebody, they ass should be still punished, just like the person who you don't know uh, should get punished. You know what I'm saying? Even if you have nothing to do with it, you looking at it from the outside, looking in it, it, the way we is, but I'm just trying to like put it in y'all mind, in my mind, like if I was in this situation, bro, I would still, he got to get punished, bro. And then my damn wife gone. You fucked your damn sister's life up. They ain't got no mama no more. I ain't got no fucking wife. You ain't got no mama. You ain't got no sister. You ain't got shit but a jail cell now. That's where your ass need to be. That's just how I look at it. And I hope he get life, y'all. Long story short, short story long. I hope his ass get life. Or at least goddamn, uh, or not at least, at the most, the death penalty. One of the two. I hope he get it. There was no nasty surprise awaiting. Since he had waived his right to a jury trial, he was at the very mercy of one single judge. And that judge, named James Burge, would sentence him to life in prison, with a minimum of 23 years behind bars. Therefore, it will be the judgment of law and sentence to court. Count one, aggravated murder. 20 years at the Lorraine Correctional Institute. Counts two and three are allied offenses of count one and are murdered. Count four, 10 years at the Lorraine Correctional Correct Institute. Counts five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 appear to be allied offenses. Count four and they are merged. Count five years, count 11, five years at the Lorraine Correctional Institute. Those sentences will run concurrently. Daniel Petrick was convicted of aggravated murder, attempted aggravated murder, and tampering with evidence. But lucky for him, due to his age, he could not be handed the death penalty. Now, the point wow. I found most questionable is how the judge perceived video games and their apparent effect on the human mind. But I guess this was 2007, right? Violent video games were a very hot topic and domestic access to these first-person shooters was still a relatively new thing. Nobody really knew what would happen to children who played it on a daily basis, so everyone assumed the worst. Nevertheless, it really is wild to see grown adults hypothesize that, just because a 16-year-old shoots fictional aliens in a video game, that he could murder his parents and expect them to respawn the following day. It really does blow my mind. But anyway, here is the judge's own perspective, which hasn't aged well over the years. I believe in the Halo 3, what it amounts to is uh, a contest to see who can shoot the most aliens 
who attack. It's my firm belief that after a while, the same physiological responses occur that occur in the ingestion of some drugs. I mean, I believe what? that an addiction to these games can do the same thing. The dopamine surge, the stimulation of the nucleus accumbens, the same as an addiction, such that when you stop, your brain won't stand for it. The other dangerous thing about these games, in my opinion, is that when these changes occur, they occur in an environment that is delusional. Because you can shoot these aliens, and they're there again the next day. You have to shoot them again. And I firmly believe that Daniel Petrick had no idea at the time he hatched this plot that if he killed his parents, they would be dead forever. Ah, but I believe there's hope here. I believe that uh, it will start here. And uh, at some point when all is known about Daniel and what occurred here, we will be able to achieve a greater sense of justice. Look, I could probably dive into this narrative on video games and violence for many hours on end, but I don't think I'm going to change any single or collective narrative. However, what I can say is that, despite decades of research and scientific studies, there is still no evidence that connects video games to real-world violence. The debate tends to centre around false positives, which are stories such as this one that are deemed to be statistically significant, when actually they're just one of chance. One other thing to consider is how many people actually play games. In the year 2022 alone, more than 3 billion people played video games. Damn. And despite the exponential growth in gaming, there is no related growth in child gamer murders. And speaking from personal experience, playing video games like Call of Duty since the age of 13, there was never any point in time that I thought killing someone in real life would mean they respawn the next day. Exactly. Whether you support the idea or not, we can all agree that wanting to play Halo 3 had a monumental influence over the death of Susan Petrick. However, blaming the video game specifically for inciting his violence is probably the wrong thing to do. Overarching behavioural issues and psychological conditions are much more likely to be at fault here. Daniel was a child under pressure with a year-long injury, and naturally born monster or not, he was in a very unhealthy frame of mind. Not even he understands why he he thought shooting his parents was anything but stupid and evil. But blaming a video game over a psychological condition, the heat of the moment, or simply misjudged parenting is very short-sighted. It is interesting that prosecutors weighed in so heavily on Halo 3. They even claimed that, quote, Daniel was for months training himself to shoot his parents. He was addicted to a particularly violent game which rendered him delusional. The judge also stated his firm belief that video games can trigger the same psychological responses as psychoactive drugs, saying, quote, such that when you stop, your brain won't stand for it. There is no scientific proof to these claims, and while I do agree with the sentence that he was given, it feels wrong for a judge to express these beliefs without any psychological background or data. Either way, 23 years behind bars as a minimum is a fitting sentence for coldly shooting his own mother. He will be 40 years old by the time he is eligible for parole, giving him just enough time to have a second chance at life after the terrible actions he had committed. Daniel has since been incarcerated at the Mansfield Correctional Institution, which is found 30 miles southwest of Wellington. He is currently 31 years old and may find freedom in 2030, should he eventually convince a panel of judges. Daniel has since been interviewed multiple times since his sentence. He often shares how he misses absolutely everything about being free. This includes the little things that he often took for granted before, of course, losing them. Mark's mental road to recovery was much longer than his physical one. The trial had left him and his family with with fresh memories of that awful evening. And despite its eventual conclusion, he still remained without a son and without a wife. There would be light at the end of the tunnel, however. It did take a few years, but he has since remarried to another woman. And although he has romantically been able to move on, 
he will always remember Susan with great fondness. Sue had always been a woman of both faith and health. After attending a Christian college and regularly attending church, both she and her husband ministered people wherever they went. Her care for others was evident right to the very end of her life. She worked at a nursing home while she also tried her best to raise her children, something that even Daniel admits she did very well. Sue loved many, and was loved by many too. This is certain. However, in the end, her death would be at the hands of her very own son. All because of an angry decision in a very poor frame of mind. And who knew that all of this could happen from being banned from a video game? I can already tell that this video will bring up quite a lot of debate about gaming and violence. So, what do you think about Daniel Petrick's case? Do you think that video games had any influence over his decisions? Or do you think it was something else? Please be kind to each other in the comments, but otherwise I'm going to wrap this case up today, folks. Thank you so much for being here for another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. And thank you, Coffeehouse Crime, for that great video that you just put together, bro. And there's so many places I can go real quick, y'all. I had so many different angles I want to talk about. So what would I talk about first? First of all, rest in peace to Susan. No, no, no doubt. Rest in peace to Sue. Um, I guess the first place I'll go is the fucking judge, y'all. His statements and shit, he is so off base. He lost the plot. He literally lost the plot. He blaming Halo. All y'all might not be gamers out there. All y'all might not, not never play Halo, but maybe you play Call of Duty or any shooting multiplayer game like that. You know, first person team death match. Trust me when I tell y'all this. That damn game may have shit to do with it. Now, if it would have been Grand Theft Auto, you maybe could make that argument. But games like Halo and shit, no, ain't nobody thinking just because we shooting aliens that we can kill people in real life and they gonna respawn. No, just because you have fun playing a video game, you can't compare that. The judge will basically compare playing a video game to somebody smoking crack and the, the, the addiction and the feeling that it gives them. You know what I'm saying? He was so off base, y'all. He was so off base. Now, like Coffee House said, yes, um, Daniel, he do deserve what he got. And being for real, y'all, I hope he don't even get out of parole. He don't need no second chance in life, if you ask me. He need to stay in that motherfucker until he die. He'd be like 40-something when he potentially can get out. Shit, they need to goddamn push that shit back to when he's 67-something. I'm just saying, man, I don't think he should get out. But the whole thing with the judge about the fucking video games, man, he off, bro. He off. I'm telling y'all, man, Halo is not a video game that turns somebody fucking violent. The only one for real if you really can think about it. It's been, now, maybe back in these days. Maybe back in these days it was like that. I don't know, man. I just remember Grand Theft Auto, man, because Grand Theft Auto, Halo ain't have no fucking cussing in it, and sex, and selling drugs, and smoking drugs, and and, and fucking, and shooting. Like, that Grand Theft Auto shoot was something different for a little child, man. Now, I can see that one, but I just can't see this, man. I just, no, man. And even that one, like I said, man, my mama let me play the shit when I was 12 years old. Hey, I'm good. I ain't kill nobody. I don't think if I kill somebody, they gonna come back to life. Or well, you know what I'm saying? I don't think I can go outside and drive down the road 100 miles per hour running from the police. Then when they finally catch up to me, I shoot at them. Then they shoot back at me. Then they finally catch me and kill me. Then I'm going to come back and wake up at the hospital alive. No, I don't think that shit. So I don't even think a lot of kids thought like that back then. But another thing real quick. It's just amazing how much that the uh, father forgave him, though. Like I told y'all. Like, you, I take that back, though, man. He should forget. I ain't gonna even say he should, but I understand him forgiving him. But you should never forget. I can never forget. I can never forget what he did. So that's why he should have got the time he got. I can I can say a lot more about this case, man. But I ain't gonna hold y'all no longer, my brothers and sisters. There was a great comeback to a coffee house crime, man. It was a great video to come. <clears throat> excuse me to come back to coffee house crime. Y'all just make sure y'all keep coming back because you know we're going to keep on watching these crazy videos. Y'all know, y'all know, y'all know. I need y'all to hit that like button, comment, subscribe if you ain't, man. Subscribe. Fuck with the bean, man. We're trying to build it up. We're building this house up over here. And until I see y'all again, my brothers and sisters, you know I got to say this.
Love, peace, and happiness. Stay safe. Don't stop. Keep going. Yeah.